everyone. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, so yeah, my name is Danielle O'Hare. I work for Lucasfilm. How many people know about Lucasfilm? And what does it have to do with learning? Um, so yeah, Lucasfilm is an entertainment company, and basically we do this, uh, <laughs> the Star Wars. So uh, games, uh, TV shows, feature films, theme parks, uh, anything you can think of uh, having to do with Star Wars comes from Lucasfilm. And I am actually today going to talk about Industrial Light and Magic, which is a division of Lucasfilm. How many people here maybe are familiar with ILM? A few of you. Oh, great, great. So ILM is a visual effects company. We create groundbreaking visual effects imagery for film. These are some of the films that we've worked on over time. We've worked on over 300 films. And we were started by George Lucas back in the 70s, um, right, right around the time he was, he was starting to make Star Wars movies. Um, the, these are the films we're working on right now. This is actually the films I can talk about. There's stuff I can't talk about. So just to give you a sense of the scope of our work, we usually have about 10 to 15 projects in-house at any given time. And today I'm going to talk to you about one of those projects, which is Rogue One. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about what ILM values as a learning organization. And these values are really aligned with what we value as a culture in our company. So the first thing is uh, we are a company of create, creative collaborators. Uh, we value creative collaboration and we share what we know. Secondly, um, we create groundbreaking imagery and often we're asking our employees to do basically the impossible. The reason I have this image here is because, I don't know, I'm guessing most of you have seen Jurassic Park, but uh, this was a game changer for our industry because prior to this film, no one had ever seen computer graphics dinosaurs that looked real before. So um, this, this was considered impossible and ILM uh, met the challenge. And then finally, we believe that everyone in our company, it doesn't matter what part of the company you sit in, everyone contributes to the creative process. So that that final image that you're seeing on the screen, that the contributions come from, from everywhere in the company. And I'll talk about those values in, in association with Rogue One. Um, real quick, so we, when we talk about the projects that we work on, we talk about movies. We actually call them shows. So I will use that term today. And I'm going to talk about the show life cycle. So this is sort of a traditional development cycle, actually a very simplified version of it for the purposes of today's talk. But basically, we have three phases. So a prep phase, a production phase, and a wrap-up phase. And for every show that we're working on, every show life cycle, we also have a learning life cycle that supports uh, the efforts on that show. And we'll talk through these. So first of all, preparation. So we have our preparation phase, which is uh, what we're doing here is we're really doing research and we're collecting information and we're trying to figure out how we're going to meet some of the challenges on our, on our current projects. And in the case of Rogue One, that was really trying to figure out the visual style of 1977. And I'm so pleased that 1977 was already mentioned earlier today. For those of you who are in the keynote, I'm going to take you back there again. Um, so that was a huge challenge for us because Rogue One basically fits in, uh, it's, it's, it happens right before the first Star Wars movie. So we had to figure out how to create the visual style of 1977, but with modern tools and really with, you know, for a modern audience. So I, I'd like to introduce you to Dennis Murin. Dennis is a visual effects supervisor. That's sort of the key creative role in our company. And um, Dennis is pretty incredible. I can't think of anybody better to um, talk to you about uh, how to make Star Wars for today because Dennis was there back in the day. Look at that nice shirt. Uh, there he was back in the 70s uh, working on the Death Star. So, so it's super cool. We have this really long legacy at ILM and we're so lucky that we get to work with some of the pioneers in the visual effects industry. Dennis is also kind of like a total rock star in my industry and um, he's highly accomplished. He's won a bunch of Oscars. But the coolest thing I think about Dennis is that he is incredibly generous with his knowledge, he, uh, with his time and with his knowledge. And with Dennis, we worked together to create a lecture series um, called the Murin Series. And it was really teaching our employees about the visual style of Star Wars. And it was really what we decided was it's not recreating shot for shot or model for model how Star Wars looked back in the 70s. We're really trying to capture how you remembered Star Wars. And Dennis was instrumental in helping everybody get um, thinking that way. 
Another challenge for us uh, was around digital characters. So this, this is, this is um, in, in, in my industry, this is really doing the impossible. Trying to create photo real humans is really, really hard. And so the challenge for Rogue One is we had this wonderful actor, Peter Cushing, who originated the role of a character called Tarkin. And, and he, was, he played that role back in the 70s. Peter Cushing passed away in the 90s, but we knew that we wanted to have this character in our film. And we had a wonderful actor named Guy Henry who was going to portray that role. But our challenge as a visual effects company was to get Guy Henry to his performance to look like Peter Cushing. And we had to do that digitally. So how does learning support this effort? Um, we brought in a number of external experts, and one of them was a wonderful scientist named Erica Rosenberg, and she is actually an expert on facial movement. She knows all about all the different muscles in the face and how if you manipulate those muscles in different ways, you can get sort of different emotions. And so we did um, a deep dive masterclass series with Erica teaching, she was teaching our folks about how to have a better understanding of the science behind the movement in, in your face. And then we also had a wonderful opportunity to uh, bring in Rebecca Stockley, who is an improviser. And I don't know how many of you guys run improv programs, but they are incredible, not only just for opening up your mind creatively, but for us, it was really about getting our folks thinking about the physicality of a performance and how to translate um, a physical performance into a digital performance. So those were some external experts that we brought in. These are some of the internal experts, subject matter experts, that I have the pleasure of partnering with. Um, these are my colleagues, just a small sampling of them from all around the globe that I worked with to build out learning programs to prepare the studio for the challenges of Rogue One. Most of these folks have technical expertise as well as artistic expertise. And frankly, they just make my job really easy because every time I ask them to do something, they say yes. Because they're really all about sharing what they know and they're, they're, they're incredibly not protective of all about that information. They're really, really open and sharing. So that's some of the work that we do to prepare for, uh, to prepare for Rogue One. Um, let's move on to the production phase. And what happens in this phase is when we actually create the imagery that goes on screen. So for us, giving and receiving feedback is huge. Um, this is an image, uh, it looks kind of, kind of like a boring image, but it, it's actually a dailies session. Does anyone, has anyone heard of dailies before? Anyone understand that concept? A few of you guys. So dailies is the practice of bringing uh, your work into a theater space and looking at the images on the big screen because our artists are working um, you know, at their desks all day long, but their, their monitors are tiny and they, we have to bring it into a theater to see whether or not their work is going to hold up on the big screen. What happens in this room is all you've got key creatives as well as peers giving critical feedback around um, about the work. And our artists need to take that feedback. Um, they go back, they iterate, and then they bring it back again, and they get more feedback. And it's a long iterative process. But gi giving and receiving feedback is key. In this case, um, we actually had the director of Rogue One, Gareth Edwards, in the room, which was kind of cool. That doesn't always happen. But he was there, too, giving his feedback. And this is an example of what you might see in a daily session. So now we have a digital Tarkin, look at that. And he, uh, we're manipulating the face to see what kind of uh, expressions we can create. So giving and receiving feedback, as I said, is essential to our business. And our business would not succeed without people being skilled in giving and receiving feedback. So to that end, we, we invest a lot of time and energy in making sure that people know both how to give feedback and receive it. Um, this is just a, a one sheet from one of the programs that we put together. But just to really emphasize that that's such a core, core skill for, for our employees. Another way we capture feedback is through our mid and post-mortem process. So uh, we, we use the term mid-mortem, which actually sounds terrible, but that, that is our term. Um, we, we call it mid-mortem. Uh, and uh, basically what we do is we, we do have a digital process for this, but, but ideally what we're doing is we're bringing people into a room and they're talking about what's going well on the project, what's not going well. And we're looking for two things here. We're really looking for problems that we can hopefully be solving sooner rather than later. And we're also looking for best practices that we can capture and share more broadly with all those other shows that we have going on in-house. Let's talk a little bit about global training. Um, I am based in San Francisco, California. These are some images of my campus. But we also have studios in Vancouver, London, and Singapore. And 
in order to do the work on Rogue One, we had to build uh, up our glo global talent base quite extensively. Exten uh, I, I, I think the scale is actually a little smaller than some of your industries, but for us, it was <clears throat> in the hundreds of people. So for, that, for us, that was a pretty big deal. Um, and the way that we do that, we have a number of different um, methods of delivery for global training, and I'm going to walk you through a few of those, but I think the thing I wanna emphasize here is that we have to be extremely flexible and agile with how we deliver training because of our fast-paced production environment. So we sort of have this whole tool set, and we kind of pick and choose according to how, how the needs in, in all the studios are quite different. So we have a content management system. We don't actually have a learning management system but we do have a content management system that we heavily invest in. We also have a training video site, so basically learning with learning paths, bite-sized videos that people can, can do in their own time. We also do traditional, good old-fashioned classroom training as needed, and we also send instructors around the world. So this is an instructor who's in Singapore. But this is probably the most common way that we deliver training these days, and that's through virtual classrooms, which I know you're all familiar with. We call it remote training, where you have an instructor on a machine, and all um, students from around the world log into the same session and, and learn um, as a community that way. And finally, artistic training. So we offer um, artistic classes in all of our studios, and it's really important for us, for the folks that are working all day long on a computer, to stay connected to the fine arts, the traditional arts. So, this is a life drawing class. We also offer, offer sculpting, photography, painting. And it's really, really key for us to um, have people stay connected to those traditional arts. Um, what's also really lovely, I, well, something I really like about these programs is they're open to everyone in the whole studio. So you don't have to be a digital artist in order to participate in these classes. They're really open to everyone and everyone gets to, co to contribute and be a part of the creative process. So finally, um, we're getting to the end of production, and I thought I would show you a little clip of, of some, a breakdown of sort of the work we did to get to a digital Tarkin. And if you can roll that clip. The original plans for this station are kept there, are they not? The original plans for this station are kept there, are they not? The original plans for this station are kept there, are they not? So there you go, there was our digital Tarkin. I don't know, it fooled my husband. I don't know about you guys. My husband was totally fooled. He thought I was a real guy. Um, it's not, all done by a computer. Um, all right, so finally, in our wrap-up phase, what we're doing here is we're really um, focused on capturing best practices. So again, we, uh, well, one thing we focus on for sure is documentation. So much documentation. We write so much documentation. We put it all in our content management system, which is an online system that is accessible to anyone in the globe. And we work as well on developing more content for our training video site, so some new learning paths given uh, the developments that happened during the production cycle. And then we run a post-mortem, an honest-to-goodness post-mortem, um, where, again, the, these post-mortems, although we are, again, looking for problems that we can hopefully troubleshoot and solve sooner rather than later, the focus for the post-mortems is really more around capturing best practices and making sure that um, other folks are uh, on, working on other shows are aware of the learnings. And finally, uh, share what you know. So um, we have a practice of bringing the entire company together to hear a presentation about uh, the work that happens on our projects. So this is an image from the Rogue One presentation that we delivered just a few weeks ago. And I had a, just a quick little story to share. Um, I, I really love these sessions. Everyone in the company gets to come and ask questions and gets to learn from the, um, the creatives on the project. But I was pleasantly surprised to look in the second row and see none other than Dennis Murin uh, at the Rogue One session. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's, it was really inspiring to me. I thought it was so great. And I've heard some themes today about leaders as trainers and also leaders as learners. And um, for me, I don't know, Dennis just really sort of embodies all these learning values I've been talking about. I kind of looked over and I thought, wow, gosh, he never stops learning. It's amazing. And uh, so I'll leave you with that thought today. Never stop learning. Thank you. Thank you.